You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 25th, 2018, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, histocompatibility testing. Our presenter is Dr. Josh Demen. He's in the Ward Family Heart Center at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. from beautiful downtown Kansas City. It's a beautiful yeah, day today, actually. It's very, the weather is nice. We had a nice thunderstorm this, this morning. Pollen count is really high. Grass pollen is now shot up. Thunderstorm asthma might be coming our way. Thunderstorm asthma. There you go. So if you're <laughs> freezing, then that's the reason why. And uh, the mold counts are really high now, too, which yeah. happens once you enter into storm. <laughs> perfect storm. Perfect. But the thing that that, that I mean, it only went up in the last week or so, and that indicates that we're heading into the summer months now because the arrow, uh, the, the things that are in the air kind of indicate what the season is, and we've entered into a summer yeah. pattern now of, of aerobiology. So yeah. don't forget the bad here. So see at the east coast, like Duke, I remember that the whole yeah. driveway was yellow from uh, past pollen. Exactly. And so um, anyway, we're. Joined today by Dr. Josh Domain. Um, Dr. Domain is a uh, professor here at Children's Mercy Hospital, and um, he's going to be talking with us about histocompatibility. There's always new stuff going on. That isn't it. It's, yeah. it's got to be the most rapidly changing field. There it's is. a rapidly changing field. Yes, it yeah. keeps it developing. And yes, absolutely. So it must be very interesting. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so thank you thing. for joining us. Uh, to join, yes, so my name is Jill Thelma. Um, uh, I run a lab at the Heart Center, and we're looking at uh, a transplantation tolerance is really what, what our focus is. But today I'll be talking about uh, uh, some of the essays uh, about the compatibility uh, testing. Um, uh, disclosure slide, yeah, unfortunately I have no real disclosures here. Um, so what we'll be talking about, or what we hopefully can, can take away from this essay is, is <clears throat> it is a better understanding of the uh, the current methods of uh, HLA testing, um, and uh, as well as describe a little bit the, the role of HLA uh, or MHC in initiating immune responses, and uh, improve understanding of the, of how all of this came about and uh, the history of the last uh, 80 or so years that, that people have been working on this. And we'll do this by going through it in exactly the reverse order. So we'll start off with a little bit of history. Uh, talk about structure and function of uh, uh, HLA or MHC, and I'll, I'll use these names interchangeably. Um, personally, I'm a mouse person, so I tend to talk about MHC, but HLA is more the human, that, um, of course, human leukocyte antigen. Uh, and then we'll finish off by talking about uh, some of the assays, and really looking at two different things, both assays to characterize HLA on cells, as well as the flip side of the coin, assays to characterize antibodies that recognize uh, HLA. Mm. Um, both are important, uh, and, and to a certain extent, uh, the assays are overlapping. Um, so if you look at the timeline of discovery, um, it really all started in the 1930s and especially 40s with uh, transplant experiments, tumor transplant experiments in mice. Uh, the observation was made that you could go from certain strains to other strains, but not, not to a third level strain. Um, and the main locus that was recognized as being determining this was the uh, H2 locus, uh, the histocompatibility 2 locus. Um, by the 1950s, transplants started in humans. The first uh, kidney transplant between twins was in 54. The first bone marrow transplants were at the end of, the, of that decade. Um, HLA started to be recognized from these transplant assays as well as, as blood transfusion, uh, responses to blood transfusions. Um, the first main uh, conference, the uh, International Compatibility Workshop, was held in '65, and that's really where people came together, organized by Bernard Amos. But people came together and decided what, what are alleles, what are assays, share reagents, uh, um, and they were held re uh, regularly after that. Um, in the 
early 70s, it was recognized that HLA in humans and H2 in mice are really the same system. Uh, skin grafts are starting to be used. And by the end of the decade, the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, characterizing this system, um, uh, followed in the 80s by cDNA cloning and uh, a crystal structure analysis, which really showed the way to how, how these molecules work. Um, at the assay level, um, what you get initially is uh, serological assays, uh, really for the first several decades, uh, based on, on patient sera, really. Um, the first molecular assays don't start until the uh, uh, late 80s. Um, uh, briefly, there are restriction fragment like polymorphism assays, uh, quickly replaced by PCR-based assays. Uh, and of course, the main assays these days are, in, in addition to the PCR-based assays, are sequence-based assays, uh, moving towards next-gen sequencing, where the whole uh, genome areas are, are sequenced. So it started off with, with mouse work at uh, Jackson Labs, uh, George Schnell and colleagues studying tumor transplants. Um, they mapped the main uh, gene to uh, chromosome 17, 6 in humans. Um, they recognized that this locus is not a single gene. There's a bunch of different genes there. They call them KDNL, uh, some of the main ones. Uh, and each of these has multiple alleles. And in bread mouse strain, uh, all of the alleles are the same. For instance, the C57 black 6 mouse has all uh, uh, B alleles. And Valve C mouse has all D alleles, um, uh, which, of course, is different from humans, where, where all the alleles are uh, different uh, for the different genes. Function, of course, was initially quite unclear, since it was something that, that came up in tumor transplant experiments, which you don't really uh, see naturally. Uh, that's not entirely true. There are infectious tumors, even in invertebrates. Um, there are certainly two going around to in, in Tasmanian devils, facial tumors, two independent ones that are transmitted through biting. For these animals, biting is the normal way of saying hi to each other. Um, so the populations are actually threatened by, by, by this particular tumor. And there's a, a well-characterized uh, uh, a uh, tumor in dogs um, that has been that arose originally 11,000 years ago has accumulated something like two million mutations in that time, that has since then spread all over the world in, in dog populations. Um, if you look uh, much earlier in invertebrates, some of the recent work, work suggests that uh, uh, infectious tumors are actually not all that uncommon. And the recent papers suggest that both cockles, mussels, and clams have transmittable tumors with up to a few percent of the population containing uh, cells that, 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 that arose from the infection. And even some, some weird cases like uh, tumors from, from these guys that don't infect other members of the same species but will infect members of a, uh, of a different species. Um, so w without this kind of tissue recognition, uh, you are vulnerable to, to these kind of things. Um, <laughs> if we look at uh, other forms of tissue recognition, uh, and this is really at the very beginning of the vertebrate lineage, these are tunicates um, that protochordates. As larvae, they have a free-swimming uh, tadpole-like larva with a notochord, which is a forerunner of a backbone. Um, but as adults, they attach, uh, and they become uh, uh, attached sessile filter feeders. Um, and they live in colonies covered by a common tunic and with a common uh, a vasculature. Uh, if two colonies bump into each other, which happens all the time, they can do two things. They can reject each other, and that's what you see happening here in the reaction zone, or they can fuse, fuse the blood supplies, the vasculature, and become a, a single uh, colony. And the decision depends on whether or not they uh, share an allele and a polyallelic gene called fusionist compatibility gene. Um, this has been cloned recently, and it's not structurally related to, to MHC. Um, and the recognition, of course, with the uh, shared allele is more like NK recognition than, than, than the typical uh, 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 self-recognition, self-non-self and in, in invertebrates. Um, uh, so, so in this case, yeah, yeah all, all these paddles are basically individual uh, animals that live in, in, in a big colony. 
Right, so there are other forms of self, not self-recognition, very early on in, in vertebrate development. Um, in uh, mammals, of course, skin graft is a standard way uh, of checking uh, uh, um, self, not self-recognition, and that's very similar whether you do it in, in mouse or in, in humans. If you have something that's accepted, for instance, after bone marrow transplant in a mouse or an autologous transplant in a human, uh, the skin will stay indefinitely. Um, if it's uh, across major transplantation barriers in mouse, uh, it's rapidly rejected, and the same thing in, in humans. Uh, within days, uh, the skin grafts are rejected in, in an immunocompetent uh, host. Um, in the 1960s, uh, really, immune response genes started to be mapped to MHC, and uh, uh, better understanding start, started to happen. And uh, it was recognized that uh, these MHC genes are essential for the immune response to protein antigens, specifically. Um, and that there were certain strains that could mount an immune response to a given uh, protein antigen, and strains that can. So there are responder and non-responder strains. Uh, for reasons that at that point in time were unclear. Um, the human side uh, really decided to sponsor blood, blood transfusions and organ transplants in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, serologically, that was defined as uh, A, B, and uh, C uh, uh, loci. Um, some of the people in, involved in all this work, uh, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, uh, is we've met George Null, uh, who did the, the initial mouse work, uh, Jean Dosset in Paris did a lot of the uh, initial uh, HLA mapping work. The Nasaraf uh, from Venezuela, um, uh, <coughs> a lot of the uh, uh, responder, non-responder work uh, worked at Harvard for a while. Van Rood is a uh, Dutch uh, HLA geneticist in, in Leiden. Terasaki worked at UCLA, uh, did a lot of the assay development there. Uh, Hugh McDevitt at Stanford. Um, uh, <coughs> did a lot of characterization of class II uh, uh, immune responses. Uh, Jan Klein, uh, a Czech uh, a scientist, um, also worked on class II and is really one of the founding members of immunology as a science. And Bernard Amos is a, a British scientist that worked at Duke and uh, was involved in, in, in all of these and in the serology development. And of course, later it was recognized that HLA uh, restricts T cell responses, which really was a, was a second uh, Nobel Prize. So if you look at function, the function of MHC really is to, uh, the biological function is to present peptide antigens to T lymphocytes to help initiate immune responses. And there are two forms of uh, uh, MHC or HLA, uh, I won't, yeah, would say MHC. Uh, class one is present in almost all of the cells. And class two is present only on a subset of cells, uh, uh, often referred to as professional antigen-presenting cells, things like dendritic cells, macrophages, uh, B cells, uh, cells that go around and, and encounter things. Uh, class one molecules interact with uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Class two molecules interact with uh, health of T lymphocytes uh, and can help initiate immune responses. Uh, how does this work? And this is one thing where the strict uh, crystal structure analysis uh, really helped a lot in understanding how, how these molecules work. Uh, and this was resolved in the, in the late 80s. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the structure of a MHC class 1 molecule. There's a heavy chain and a light chain called the beta 2 microglobulin. The heavy chain, uh, the uh, business part, so to speak, uh, forms a flat uh, uh, beta-plated sheet with two alpha helices on top, uh, in between which that space to bind the uh, bind peptide antigen, um, which was immediately recognized, obviously, as a, a logical place for, for it to be, to be binding. Um, uh, class two has a similar, if slightly, structure. Uh, if, if it arrives at a, through a slightly different uh, mechanism here, there's two chains that are fairly similar each of which forms half of that beta plated sheet, and each of its contributes one of these alpha helices. Um, so it's not a heavy and light chain, but uh, two fairly similar uh, chains. Um, that's another look at the structure and the main polymorphic residues uh, in, in uh, a class in MHC molecules, and they're very much uh, clustered in, in this region. Um, 
the most dense, well, obviously outside of this region too, but this peptide binding region, uh, where a lot of these uh, uh, differences are, are found. Um, so how does recognition go in, go in its work? Uh, in order for a peptide to be bound to an MHC molecule, and that's what makes a responder strain to a uh, 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 um, to a particular peptide antigen, the peptide has to be able to bind the uh, MHC. There are a number of requirements. Uh, one is simply size. It's too big or too small, it's not going to bind properly. Uh, then there are specific anchor residues. Um, so the specific uh, residues that are necessary to bind it properly to any given MHC molecule. Uh, um, and that differs per, per mo uh, MHC molecule. Um, uh, if that's the case, if it's the right size, if it's the right anchor residues, it can be bound and can be presented to T cell receptors. And the T cell receptors see both parts of the uh, peptide, but they also see actually morphic residues of the uh, 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 MHC molecule. And that's really, of course, what, what they've been uh, selected for uh, uh, during their maturation. Uh, and this is really just to uh, 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 remind me to say, uh, of course, that T cell uh, signaling is a lot more complex than the uh, uh, T cell receptors uh, interacting with uh, uh, MHC. There's a lot of other signals that have to be given uh, in the proper way. Otherwise, you end up with an energetic uh, T cell that can respond to anything. Um, but the actual T cell signaling is, is way beyond what I want to go in this detail. Um, what, what's really the difference between class 1 and class 2? And you can see that if you look at how they uh, get their peptide antigens. Uh, for class 1 molecules, they present uh, endogenous antigens. So uh, if, if peptides or proteins uh, produced in the cell are kind of done, so to speak, they kind of can get run through uh, something like what you would call a protein shredder, a proteasome. Uh, which results in peptides being generated. These can be uh, imported into the ER and through uh, a bunch of specific molecules can be loaded uh, into a class 1 uh, MHC molecule, to which once these vesicles fuse with the membranes, uh, this will be at the cell surface and can be uh, interrogated by these cells. For class 2, it's quite a different route. Here, an exogenous antigens are taken up from the environment into endosomes where they eventually get degraded, <laughs> resulting again in peptides. This can fuse with uh, ER, uh, ER uh, vesicles, um, where then again these peptides can be loaded into class II uh, molecules that and again can be transported to the surface. But so these present um, peptides that are present in the uh, surrounding uh, area. And of course, if a cell travels, the cell can be in the skin, uh, pick up antigens, and then travel to a lymph node to present them. Um, if you look at the genomics of uh, MHC, it's about a 4 megabase pair region, com comprising about 0.1% of the human genome. And it's actually the most gene dense uh, region uh, of the whole genome, containing about 0.6% of all uh, genes. Um, and many of these are uh, potential immune genes, so not just the class 1 genes uh, that are here and the class 2 that are here. So it goes 1, 3, 2. Um, but uh, things like the, 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 those proteins that are involved in peptide transport and loading and things like that are all uh, in this area, uh, heat shot proteins, uh, receptors, uh, etc. Um, and many of these genes uh, are polyallelic. Um, um, so this picture shows really the, uh, uh, the number of alleles recognized about eight years ago, with every dot representing 50 alleles. Um, uh, what this picture does show nicely is that uh, certain uh, genes are very uh, are highly uh, polymorphic, others are less so. So class one is shows the most uh, variability uh, in certain of the class 2 genes. Um, but all in that, about a few thousand uh, alleles recognized uh, eight years ago. If you look at what's currently in the database, and this was as of uh, March this year uh, when I updated this, there's about 18,000 uh, named alleles in the uh, main database uh, if you combine class 1 and class 2. And 
not all of these are different proteins. Uh, a lot of these are, um, so, no, some of these are in non-coding region. Some of these are not expressed. That's probably about uh, 10,000 or so different proteins uh, in, in those 18,000. Um, but so that is rapidly increasing. Of course, the thing that, that caused this is that there's a lot of sequence analysis going on, uh, uh, which is really why you recognize the, uh, the new alleles uh, uh, readily. Uh, uh, I don't think anybody really knows where this is coming from. Uh, that, that seems like a lot of HLAA class 1 antigens. Right. 14,000 different. Is there like a taxonomy of them where some are more closely related to others? That, that certainly are, uh, yes. And like I say, some, some are. Uh, uh, so you can kind of follow historically back to how they yeah. duplicated and generated uh, in population. Exactly. And some are in, in coding regions, some are in non-coding regions. Yeah. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, uh, and my my personal guess would be I haven't checked into this, but I would think that most of the sequencing would be Europe and the U.S. And I would bet that most of the variability is going to be in Africa. So that's probably a lot. That's the oldest population. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't think uh, we're done here uh, 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 anytime soon. Um, a lot of uh, disease conditions, of course, are associated with, with these this important uh, region uh, uh, autoimmune diseases almost uh, automatically. You would expect them to correlate with particular uh, haplotype, uh, HLA haplotypes, and, and they certainly do, uh, as do uh, various other genes, like uh, various other conditions, uh, uh, a whole bunch of monogenic conditions, drug sensitivities, infectious diseases, and cancers. That, that where uh, sensitivity uh, are, that are associated with particular uh, alleles. Um, so why would it be, uh, or why is it important to, uh, to be able to do uh, testing for which alleles you have? I um, uh, uh, already mentioned, of course, the MHC-associated diseases, uh, which where it may be important to, to know what, what kind of alleles you have, uh, for instance, how you respond to certain uh, medications or how uh, likely are to develop a particular immune condition. Um, and of course, there's tissue transplant, where the outcome is definitely uh, better if you uh, match more closely. Um, uh, and in addition, the outcome is going to be better if you don't have antibodies that recognize uh, 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 particular HLA alleles. Uh, so you yeah, have a lack of uh, panel reactive uh, antibodies, PRA. Uh, uh, the figure here is just an example of, of uh, long-term survival of bone marrow transplant patients. In this case, they uh, characterized eight uh, HLA loci, and they split it out by people that all eight are matched. Seven out of eight are matched, or six out of eight are matched. And with every mismatch, you lose you have about 10% more people that uh, 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 that 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 die, uh, and, and for which the, the transplant doesn't work out in the long term. Um, so in, in that sense, it, it's important to be able to, uh, uh, to do this kind of testing. Um, so for the testing, we'll kind of go through it uh, basically, again, as it's historic, historically developed, um, which starts with uh, serological assays. Um, we'll briefly touch on the uh, mixed inside uh, reactions and, and uh, look at some of the uh, molecular assays, which is really what, what uh, is being used uh, these days. Um, so serological assays are based on the fact that if you take cells which express a certain uh, uh, HLA molecule in this case, an anti-serum that recognizes that particular HLA molecule, and in the original uh, um, assays, this is all patient serum, um, and you mix those and add complement, uh, rapid complement, uh, cells are recognized as being mice. Um, and this assay, of course, can be used in two ways. If you try to determine uh, what is on a particular uh, cell, patient cells, you can add known antisera and see which ones lies the cells. Uh, uh, that would be on the cells. On the other hand, if you want to know what's in a particular uh, antiserum, uh, in, in a particular patient serum, you can take known cells and uh, um, uh, do basically the same uh, uh, reaction and, and get, get an answer. Um, and both things are done. Uh, so this is uh, called the complement-dependent microlymphocytotoxicity assay. Uh, it's a rapid and cost-effective assay. Um, 
but well, certainly initially hampered by the fact that there were no standard reagents that used patient serums uh, was variable. People had to share reagents in order to see if they're looking at the same thing. So what eventually happened is that NIH set up a serum bank and distributed uh, the serum nationally from these assays. Um, of course, the development of monoclonal assays uh, um, uh, allowed uh, more standard uh, uh, reagents to be used. Assay is still in use, but uh, not so much for HLA testing per se, but to look at cross matches in, in transplants, I think, because it is a rapid and, and, and sensitive assay. Um, and one of the people instrumental in developing this was Paul Terazaki, including the development of uh, Terazaki plates, which allowed the uh, um, reaction to take place in a volume of a couple of microliters. Um, and these plates also, you can see the whole bottom of the well in a single microscope field face contrast all the way to the edge. Um, they're actually really nice plates to work with. So you have to click on the slide itself again to get to, to reselect it. Okay. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, mixed lymphocyte cultures uh, uh, were typically used for class II uh, assays. Um, in this case, you have a, uh, a, a stimulator population that's typically irradiated and a responder population that's allowed to respond to, from a different individual to respond to a stimulator uh, um, and then starts proliferating, in which time, uh, certainly in the original assays, uh, like tritium, uh, tritiated uh, was added uh, to, to uh, quantitate the proliferation. The uh, problem with this assay, it's time consuming, it takes, you know, a long time, uh, days. It's quite variable, it needs lots of cells. Uh, there were some variations made uh, uh, that were a bit more sensitive, but this is really not used as a uh, typing assay anymore, though it is still used as a research uh, tool to see how, uh, uh, what kind of responses you have against uh, a particular uh, piece of response, as you can see. Um, Molecular assays really started with restriction fragment length polymorphisms in the late 80s, um, which were briefly uh, used. Uh, so these are assays when you do uh, a restriction digest of genomic DNA, blot it, uh, and uh, hybridize with a probe and look at uh, uh, differences in, in restriction uh, uh, length uh, fragments that are recognized by the probe. Um, they, they work, but they're kind of difficult to develop for a lot of different genes, and they were rapidly replaced by PCR-based techniques, which was developed at around the same. PCR technique was developed around the same time, uh, and is much more uh, suited for this, this type of analysis. Um, so one of the initial uh, um, assays is, is called sequence-specific oligonucleotide probe hybridization. Uh, where uh, test DNA from the subject is amplified and mobilized on a membrane uh, and then hybridized with uh, a number of labeled probes and recognize specific alleles. Um, advantage is that you can optimize your hybridization conditions uh, for each of the probes. Uh, disadvantage is that you have to do different hybridizations for each probe, uh, and it's simply not very practical for, for typical clinical testing because you have to do a lot of different uh, uh, hybridizations. However, you reverse this. Um, um, so if you immobilize the probe, um, and that can, either in, can be in a specific pattern on a glass light uh, uh, or on, on uh, nitrocellulose on a membrane or on luminex beads, um, and then hybridize with uh, the amplified and biotinylated test DNA, then you can do a single hybridization and check everything in, in one go. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that the hybridization conditions have to be similar for the many different probes that you are testing. If they're very different, they obviously not going to get, get an outcome. Um, to briefly uh, I go through Luminax, uh, uh, it's a uh, flow cytometry system where you use a number of different beads that have two different kinds of fluorochromes mixed in. Um, that gives you a hundred different uh, beads recognizable on, on these two le levels of fluorochromes. 
uh, each of which can be uh, uh, used to attach either DNA, RNA, or proteins to for uh, assays, so which you can mix them and you can uh, do a hundred assays, up to a hundred assays in a single go, uh, which then analyzed by uh, in a specialized flow cytometer, which recognizes uh, which peak you're looking at, and then in, in addition, uh, how much uh, is uh, uh, bound to that peak. So for um, uh, this kind of uh, um, um, PCR analysis, you would bind to each of the uh, beads uh, a specific uh, probe. Uh, here in this case, this bead has DR15, this one DR16. And you uh, amplify and biotinylate your test subject's DNA through a hybridization. Uh, if the real sequence is present, you're going to get a, a solid hybridization. Uh, you're going to get some background staining. In, in other cases, which you wash out, uh, uh, um, which is why hybridization can be simply important. Then you can come back and label these uh, biotinylated DNA with uh, 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 a fluorochrom label to extract evidence and thus recognize it uh, when you analyze it on the uh, flow cytometer that these don't have PE, these will have PE. Um, then uh, that is also basically standard uh, PCR, uh, sequence-specific uh, primer PCR. Um, uh, advantages, of course, it's a rapid rapid reaction. Uh, there's no need for an expensive instrumentation like a uh, Luminex machine for uh, machines that can read uh, glass uh, um, uh, uh, <coughs> glass or membranes with particular uh, um, patterns of, uh, of probes on it. Um, but it does require many different PCR reactions for higher resolution typing. But uh, the only instrumentation here would be a standard PCR machine, um, which we just pretty much present uh, anywhere. Um, and then, of course, uh, the most powerful of all is sequence-based uh, uh, typing. Um, uh, and one of the reasons it is so powerful is that this is the only assay really that can recognize, uh, can identify unrecognized alleles. All the other assays uh, uh, test alleles that have been previously recognized. This doesn't make any assumptions. It just looks what's present. Um, there can be some ambiguity due to amplification of both alleles. Uh, a lot of the sequence-based typing uh, basically only looks at that variable region, the beta pleated sheet and the uh, alpha helix as well. Polymorphisms are so that would be in effect on three in class two, uh, two and three in class one. Um, um, how what this is, is moving to, uh, uh, of course, these days is that to next-gen uh, uh, sequencing techniques where you do just uh, genomic sequencing and look at the whole gene introns, uh, promoter regions, etc. So not just the uh, uh, the protein encoding uh, uh, regions, and, and that will really be the assay where we'll uh, uh, increasingly uh, end up. Um, uh, this is just as an overview of the different uh, uh, um, techniques and uh, advantages and, and limitations. Um, hopefully readable on the, on the printout. Um, with the number of alleles that have been recognized now, the naming convention uh, had to change. Um, and the old system became quite, quite confusing because there were continuous changes in what used to be an A9 local that had to be split in a 23 and 24 lockers, etc., etc. Um, so now it looks quite uh, um, daunting, really. Uh, but um, so it, there's a gene uh, name ABC. Um, there is a group. Uh, it could be you know, B27 or uh, A2, like here. There's a, a second group of numbers that indicates uh, specific protein uh, changes. Um, there's a third group that shows changes in DNA um, in the coding region. Fourth group that shows changes in DNA in the non-coding region. Um, and then uh, it ends with a letter that indicates uh, 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 particular uh, things about protein expression. And here means a null allele that's not expressed. Uh, and S would mean uh, um, a secreted allele that's not retained in the membrane. Uh, L is low level expression. A number of different letters uh, that, that can be used to indicate what, what the deal is with the protein. Is the uh, expression?
expression affected by epigenetics, like methylation? Does that have any role in nature? Uh, uh, I'm sure it does, but uh, uh, I don't know that, that meant these assays wouldn't be looking at that, uh, uh, obviously. Okay. Uh, um, I'm only briefly going to touch on the minor uh, secundability antigen today. Uh, uh, for one, they're mostly on the fine, um, and they're far less important, but they do play a role. Um, um, they can be important in things like graph versus tumor induction. Um, uh, the same thing for K receptors in, in, in X cells. Um, and characterization there uh, uh, may become more and more important and may become part of the standard pattern. Um, but it's a little bit outside of the uh, uh, HLA that, uh, uh, it, it, that, that I'm focusing on today. But it's it is part of the whole physical compatibility uh, uh, area. Um, and so the uh, uh, second uh, uh, area or assay area to talk about is uh, um, anti-HLA antibodies. Uh, it's kind of the flip side of the coin, um, as I said. Um, so you have both um, the uh, HLA molecules that are expressed in cells. Um, and those need to match in order to, uh, uh, say, in a transplant situation, to get a good outcome. But if those antibodies have recognized HLA, that can also prevent a good outcome, even if that is uh, matching, uh, uh, say, 7 out of 8 or 10 out of 11 out of 12 matching uh, otherwise. That, that would give a good outcome. Um, um, and why would you have uh, antibodies that recognize HLA? Uh, and there are a number of different reasons. Um, you can be exposed to antigens, for instance, through pregnancy, uh, where, where there's always some crossover into the uh, maternal blood of uh, a cell. You can be exposed to blood transfusion or, or transplantation. But it can also happen if you haven't been exposed at all to things like molecular mimicry. Uh, uh, antibodies can cross-react to epitopes for which they, and, and molecules for which they would select it. Um, this is a significant barrier for transplantations, but up to a third or so of them are sensitized to, uh, uh, to an incoming, uh, to a potential organ available for transplantation. In addition um, to the uh, initial transplant uh, situation, where you want to uh, avoid hyperacute rejection by antibodies, there's also uh, chronic rejection where it's Increasingly, you recognize that antibody-mediated re mediated projection is a very important component. Um, uh, you know, people have been focusing on T-cells for a long time uh, and uh, basically done away with T-cells uh, as important in, in the setting, but um, it's increasingly recognized that, um, you know, while the uh, acute rejection is mostly a T-cell-based rejection, and that's really very well controlled by the uh, immunosuppressants, but the chronic rejection is a much more complicated process. Can I ask a question? Sure. So since there are, um, like, red blood cells don't have any HLA MHC, right, how, how do you get exposure through blood transfusion? Uh, because you not just transfuse typically red blood cells, right, there'll be white blood cells as well. Some. Yeah, it, even in washed red cells, small amount, a few white cells. Yeah. Still some. Okay, so that yeah. does wonder if it's just the low level. Yeah, too. and it's not like typically people that get a single, but it's people people that that get repeated. Multiple, multiple, yeah. yeah, so overall the white blood cell and MHC exposure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so what, what kind of assays are, to, are there to look for antibody? Um, Initially, it's the same base cell based serological assays. Uh, so, that they don't work for recognizing HLA, it also works for recognizing um, uh, antibodies uh, if you use uh, uh, cells that are uh, known. Um, um, uh, um, and for this test cell set, uh, so, so you, again, you need to uh, uh, recognize, you need cells that have specific sets of uh, uh, HLA uh, molecules at the surface and to, in, 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 to be able to get any kind of assay that you can uh, correlate from uh, place to place. You kind of need to distribute these cell lines on a continuous basis. Um, so it's, it, it 
it takes quite a bit of organization to use this as an assay for that. Uh, and that really has been replaced now by uh, solid phase testing with uh, clone components. Um, and solid phase uh, testing can be done in a number of different ways. Um, you can directly look at uh, uh, the cells themselves. Um, so you can take a do cells from a potential uh, organ donor uh, and incubate them with a serum from a, a potential host. Um, if there's antibodies present, they will bind these cells. And then you can visualize that with secondary antibodies that are recognized the primary uh, antibodies. Um, and then you can simply look by flow cytometry how many of these uh, uh, cells are positive. Like in this case, about 78%, which then is referred to as a PRA of 78%. Uh, um, you can do it by ELISA, where again you can uh, bind uh, particular uh, protein antigens and then see, uh, from the donor and then see how the uh, potential host uh, uh, serum recognizes it, so which one they recognize. <coughs> and what's used most often these days uh, is beat bound uh, um, antigens, where you can do a luminex type type uh, uh, reaction, um, which is shown in a bit more uh, detail here. So again, you can take all these different beads and bind different uh, proteins to, um, <coughs> and incubate that with the uh, potential host serum and see which of these uh, uh, um, bound uh, proteins uh, or protein fragments are recognized by, by uh, pre-existing antibodies. And then these are visualized by secondary again. Uh, at which point you run them through the, uh, uh, the Luminex machine, which can recognize which which, uh, which peptide this is and uh, how bright it is. Um, and you can code with different things. You can code with multiple class one or two antigens. You can code with antigens from an individual donor to see how much response you get. Or um, you can use clone single uh, HLA uh, antigens. Um, at the tops uh, and see which ones are being recognized. Um, and this is an example of what, what a readout like that would look like. So you can see the different beads being recognized by, by those different levels of uh, uh, mixed in uh, uh, fluorochrome. Uh, and then you can look in a third uh, column to see how bright it is, how much uh, uh, response there has been to that particular uh, bound peptide antigen. And then you see basically three regions here. One set that is clearly positive, one set is clearly negative, and one set where uh, um, it basically becomes uh, somewhat questionable where you call it positive and where you call it negative. And people can differ uh, uh, in, in what they call positive and negative there. Where you have to worry about things like, like uh, um, uh, false positive and negatives uh, and, and artifacts in the assay. Um, there are uh, variants of these, these assays. Um, for instance, uh, one of the thoughts was um, it's not so much the antibodies themselves that are the important uh, uh, in, in uh, rejecting organs. It's antibodies that can find complement, uh, which not all of them do, uh, and that can uh, uh, lead to a uh, uh, rejection of an organ. So there's a C1Q assay that was developed there. And the serum is pre-mixed with uh, C1Q, which is one of the complement uh, uh, components. And antigens, some of the antigen, uh, uh, antibodies will bind them, others won't. Then you incubate them with uh, um, the beads that, that have different uh, uh, protein antigens. And the secondary here recognizes C1Q, not uh, uh, the antibody itself. Um, but then you only see the cells read out that, that actually have C1Q um, after washing. There's still some uh, debate. Uh, uh, this has been out there for a few years now, still debate as to how much this really adds uh, in, in a, a given situation. Um, um, there are limitations, obviously, also in solid uh, uh, phase testing. Um, you know, with approximately 18,000 of these out there, even if they don't all represent different proteins, and each of these with multiple dots, um, that's not, you're not going to uh, put these in the hundreds in the next piece. Um, then there can be artifacts as well. Um, so typically you have 
uh, peptides bound to the uh, um, to the beads or um, to the uh, wires or whatever way you're looking at it, which can lead to conformational changes. And for instance, uh, epitopes can show that wouldn't be available to antibodies on the original protein. So you can get new epitopes that are recognized by antibodies that really wouldn't be a problem at all. Um, uh, in, 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 which I really don't recognize uh, uh, in, in the normal uh, situation. Um, same thing you can get false negative, uh, for instance, the shared epitopes between uh, a particular um, <coughs> uh, antigens. Um, antibodies recognition can be diluted out um, and can be lower than it really is. Um, uh, and interference, um, for instance, by IgM, but also by certain complement factors that can be present in the serum can also lead to false negatives, uh, where they prevent uh, antibodies or secondary antibodies from binding. Um, and like I say, there's still some discussion going on as to whether um, <coughs> there is uh, how important really uh, things like complement binding uh, are and how much this really adds to the assay. Um, and people are not looking at uh, best sets to try and figure it out for different transplant situations. Uh, and this, is, again, is basically the uh, overview of the, uh, the different uh, that we just talked about and uh, some of the advantages and disadvantage, uh, disadvantages, uh, including at the same time. Um, but uh, basically, uh, what this has moved to uh, in, uh, <coughs> with the antibody setting and what really happens these days mostly is, is what is called a virtual cross-match, um, where rather than directly testing um, donor cells with host serum, um, which, you know, to look at PRAs, which was what initially was done for transplant candidates, you can make a prediction as to how much response they're going to be based on these um, uh, solid phase amino assays for particular um, uh, HLA antigens without directly testing uh, um, <coughs> host and donor cells in, in a single assay, um, which, of course, greatly facilitates uh, um, uh, allocation of organs that are available for transplantation, um, because you know from a particular host what, what they're going to respond against, because that can be done as soon as you put them on the transplant list, and then once an organ can be available with the other part of the uh, virtual cross match, then, then it's a computer matching thing to see who would be a good, uh, good candidate, and this has an excellent correlation with, uh, with outcome, and that's how typically uh, um, most of the antibody cross-matching happens uh, these days. Um, and I think that was as far as I went with this, uh, this lecture. So if there's any questions. This virtual cross-match is an actual thing in yeah. use now, okay. And what's kind of the predictive value? I mean, what, or in other words, kind of what's the fail rate? Because obviously failure is a terrible thing that happens. Yeah, no, it's in the, in the 90 plus uh, uh, range, uh, uh, accurate. Uh, and that's as acceptable as yeah. putting the, the cell lines together and right. To get, okay. But you can still do it if you have questions or like like say if you have a lot in that area where you wonder is this real or is this not real. Right. You can always fall back on uh, uh, um, actually mixing the things together. Uh, mm -hmm. um, if say the person would be high on the list and. Uh, cool. So it's it's still true that success rate of a transplant depends on how close the match is to the, to the, the donor is to the recipient? It depends a little bit on what you're looking at, if you're looking at solid organ transplant versus uh, uh, bone marrow transplant. And bone marrow, yes, very much so. And they do the most extensive HLA testing. Yeah. Um, in solid organ transplant, things like heart transplant for the longest time, I think often they still do, they do uh, AB blood uh, uh, matching. Why isn't it as critical? Other solid? things like kidneys, yeah. I, I they do do. Yeah, well, why, like is it, it, why is it as important in solid? What's the difference? Uh, they do give a lot of uh, uh, um, 
uh, immunosuppressants and uh, organs like, uh, it, it depends a lot on the organ. So if you have an organ with a lot of uh, external surface, say a uh, lung, uh, uh, say a bowel, uh, and a lot of immunosurveillance, um, it becomes much more critical. Um, if it's something like the heart, which is relatively easy to transplant, um, because there's much less uh, easy to transplant in the sense that you get long-term survival. Um, yeah. And if you look at 10-year data, it's more than half of them are still working, whereas so say for long it's, it's 20 So closer matching might still be good for heart, but right. it's not as critical? Yeah, and the problem is you get, it's already so difficult to get a match yeah. um, and to get something that, that's functioning properly. And we're not even talking pediatric, where you have size yeah. requirements, so that makes it even much more difficult. Um, Right, yeah, for solid organs, it's not just about the HLA, it's about like the size and all those other yeah. factors. Yeah, by the way, I'm sorry. Like the size of the organ, if it's going to... Sure. Like the lung, how well it functions, people go back and forth, can you still use these lungs, uh, you know, a, a big center like, say, Duke may take lungs that are iffy because they know they can pull them through, but a smaller center may only go for, for, for the less lung, so... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of back and forth on that one once an organ comes uh, comes available. I, I remember hearing, uh, like for transplants for cancer, like leukemia, something like that, that having it a little bit mismatched is actually better because somehow the, yes. the donor will detect the cancer cells if they recur and kill them more quickly. Is that is that true? Yes. Yeah, so that's a two-edged sword thing. Uh, so it's a graph where there's still more... So you want a little bit of rejection, more. but just not too much. Is, you want the GVT, the graph versus tumor response, but you don't want the graph versus host response. Can you separate the two out? <laughs> People have been working very hard on that for a long, long time, and it's very tricky because that's similar. And that's where things like minor transplantation antigens can come in, yeah. and they can really help with the graph versus tumor response. That's of course what we're trying to do. People trying to do with CAR T uh, cells now as a whole. Uh, um, to, to develop responses against some of the tumor antigens. Is it possible um, to develop... But, but yeah, so you, you have more... You cannot completely separate the two, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, so allogeneic transplants, while they have more initial death, can have a better long-term survival because of that very effect, because they attack the cancer as well, or the residual cancer cells. Is, is it possible to develop cells that don't have MHC on them so that they're immune to being rejected? Is that, has that ever been? Uh, yeah, but then the NK cells would go crazy. Yes. Hmm. So, yes, tumor cells have learned that trick too, but um, that's why we kind of have a backup system too. Obviously, the MHC system is a really critical one to have. There's always this question, well, why do we have this stupid thing anyway? It makes it hard to transplant, but we didn't, right. we didn't evolve to, to receive transplants. We evolved to not be each other. If, 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 I, if my MHC was the same as yours, my cells getting on you would infect you. Right. We don't really want to infect each other with our cells. That, that's what's happening to the Tasmanian devils. So you've heard of right. that. They've got this cancer, and the, yeah. they're all genetically related to each other. The cancer becomes an infectious disease. Yeah, no, exactly. There's a couple of examples of yeah. infectious cancers. Yeah, like say, I'm yeah. going around in dogs. Uh, um, there are other forms of self, non-self recognition, and I showed that example of the tunic. It's very yeah. Really I thought that was red, uh, uh, lineage. Uh, yeah. Fascinating little animals. Uh, That's crazy. For a number of reasons, they rebuild the entire body once a week. They do. They what? They rebuild the entire body once a week. They do away with the old one and build a new one. I could use a little bit of that myself. <laughs> Rejuvenation. There you go. All right. Any other questions? A quick uh, random question. Do you know if there's any like uh, CRISPR technology application in, in uh, stem cells by any chance? Uh, HLA type? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware immediately of any, any examples um, uh, where people are, are playing with CRISPR to, to make changes in, in, in HLA. Ooh. Much of that would be less subtle, of course, like if you talk about, you know, and, uh, for, for xeno transplants or things like that, uh, it's much more transplanting whole area and, and whole gene clusters and not so much changing a single one. Uh, um, it, it would make sense if you wanted to do something where you had just a minor mismatching, you know, like 
problem. Well, for that tumor thing that we were talking yeah. about, maybe you could change it so that it becomes yeah. tumor, but not tumor not person. But then you would have a fully matched one available um, uh, to, to kind of put that in. Yes. So yeah, there might be things that, that eventually develop. But, but uh, you know, ideally, you could have like a uh, kind of a standard transplant stem cells. Just get a stem cell clone and then change the MHC to match whoever the recipient is before you put it into them. If, if that technology could be uh, developed, maybe take the person's MHC, splice it out, put it into the to the donor cells that are kind of a generic donor cell, and then right. put those back in. And yeah, that's what match. people are hoping for with the yes. I think we still have a ways to go. I, I know, that's science fiction, but yeah. it'll probably be happen in 10 years. Yeah. I mean, you still can grow in blood stem cells. So. <coughs> yeah, it's we can't really do it now, but, anyway. It's fun to yeah, about. But yes, cells, yeah, you can expand them indefinitely, so you can theoretically do stuff like that. But yeah, yeah so you can have an off-the-shelf stem cell transplant line that could just be modified to match whoever the recipient is on, on demand. Generics. That would solve right. the, the transplant problem, wouldn't it? It would make things a whole lot uh, easier, you know, so, of course, with it. Yeah. As there is more and more deals available, it becomes more and more tricky to... Uh, right, I think you guys ought to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the problem, though, you, you might fix the stem cell, but it's still got to be in the right neighborhood with the right factors to oh, yeah, become what it needs would to need become, to right? The stem cell so it could become whatever it needs to become. Yeah, but if you don't have the external cell factors, it could become, yeah. To Tell yeah, it could be a, a hemopoietic stem cell, or it could be a multi pleural potential stem cell. Or it could be an ESL that becomes a teratoma, which yeah. would be a good thing. Maybe it's yeah. not just the cell line that went bad, maybe it's the neighborhood that went bad. Yeah. They don't have the right factors to make it grow healthy and not induce changes. Right. Right. So, but you yeah. take a good kid and put them in a bad neighborhood, their chances are going to come out bad in the end, right? <laughs> yeah. so, it, yeah. If you're looking at things like ESLs, yeah, you have to really worry about those differentiated cells in there after you're done with it, because those can get out of control pretty easily. Well, things um, certainly that, that would be worse than than, than, you, than you were before. So I think things have certainly advanced since the last time I've been a couple of years since I've heard yeah. that you speak, but it, it's always in, in advancing and changing, and that that's, that's, it must be an exciting uh, field to yeah. be working in. So, but anyway, th thank you so much for. Yeah, thank you. Okay.